Hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Mary Choi. First, I would like to thank the Asian Author Alliance for hosting and celebrating Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month by having authors and artists come together for virtual panels and events throughout the month of May. It's been such an amazing lineup and I'm so glad we get to be a part of it. And it is my pleasure to introduce the authors who come from all over the country on this panel, the challenges of writing about racism in KidLit. Our discussion today will focus on sharing our experiences as Asian Americans, how our backgrounds influence the stories that we write and how Asian Americans have been impacted by systemic racism. I'll give a quick intro of all the esteemed panelists before we jump into questions. First up, Joanna Ho is the New York Times bestselling author of Eyes That Kiss in the Corners. Her upcoming picture books include Playing at the Border, A Story of Yo-Yo Ma, Eyes That Speak to the Stars, and One Day. Her debut YA novel, The Silence That Binds Us, releases in 2022. She has a passion for anti-racism equity work. She holds a BA in psychology from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's from the Principal Leadership Institute at Berkeley. She is the vice principal of a Bay Area high school and she survives on homemade chocolate chip cookies, outdoor adventures, and dance parties with her kids. Welcome, Joanna. Hi, it's so nice to be here. I'm so um, honored to be on this amazing panel. So I just thought I'd show a couple cover. I really don't have that many to show, but here's Eyes That Kiss in the Corners. And then um, I just have the F and G's for playing at the border, which is out to September, Ooh. but super excited to be on the panel with everyone. Um, next up is Nancy Olin was born in Tokyo, Japan and divided her childhood between there and Ohio. She is the author of the YA novels, Bewitch, and its sequel, Witch Wising, Consent, Beauty, and Always Forever, as well as the Blast Off Early Grade History series. She has written or ghostwritten over a hundred books for children, teens, and adults. She lives in Ithaca, New York. We're practically neighbors, Nancy. <laughs> Where are you? I'm in New York City. <laughs> Yay, that's really cool. Well, th thank you for this. And I too am very, very honored and to be on this panel. I'm really excited to have this conversation um, to join with the other conversations that are happening in May. Um, and I, I will also share some book covers. So um, I'm the co-author with Paige McKenzie of Bewitch, which is a um, YA novel about some witches in trouble. And then the, the uh, sequel, which is coming out this fall, this is a, a advanced reading copy, which is called Witch Rising. Thank you. It's so exciting. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and next, Misa Segura's uh, ancestors include a poet, a priestess, a samurai, and a stowaway. She is the author of the award-winning It's Not Like It's a Secret, the highly acclaimed This Time Will Be Different, and a short story entitled Where I'm From in Come On In, a young adult anthology of stories and immigration. Her latest book, Love and Other Natural Disasters, will release in a couple of weeks. Wow, in uh, June 8th, yay, and is available for pre-order. Misa lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her husband, two sons, and three uh, cats. Welcome, Misa. Thank you. Sorry, I just had to mute myself because the people across the street have suddenly begun chopping down trees or something. Um, <laughs> hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna throw some copy, uh, some pictures at you. What are these called? Covers? <laughs> so this is, um, this time will be different. Uh, my second book. And um, yeah, this is the one that, this is one that sort of is the one that sort of most directly addresses a, it, it thinks I'm, it thinks it's a person, I guess. Sorry. Um, addresses anti-Asian racism. Uh, it has to do a little bit with the Japanese American internment during World War II and its lingering effects um, and its echoes through history. And um, this other one, this new one is coming out in June, um, Love and Other Natural Disasters. And it is less really about racism, more about just celebrating um, Asian girls being in love and um, so sort of focusing on just the joy of being a person in the world. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Misa. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm Mary Choi. I'm a board certified clinical pharmacist and educator. 
I'm also the co-author of a nonfiction um, book for teens, Healthcare Heroes, the uh, Medical Careers Guide. It's a book that helps uh, teens find their uh, best career path. Um, and there's 28 stories um, in this book. Um, so it's so exciting to be here with all of you. Um, I personally really enjoy book panels, whether it's watching them or participating in one. And this one is such a meaningful one um, to me. And we've got such inspirational authors here with us today. So that's really amazing. And I hope we all get to meet in person um, one day. Um, so we'll jump right in and get started with the first question to the panel. Um, how has anti-Asian racism affected you personally? And what prompted you to include elements of anti-Asian racism in your book? We'd love to start off with uh, Nancy. Sure. Um, so I was born in Japan and I was there until I was about almost 10 years old and my, my family moved us to Ohio. But the earliest memory I have anyway of, of, of racism against me is when I was six, um, I was in Ohio visiting my American grandparents and I was playing in a local park and this girl, this blonde girl came up to me and said, my parents said, I can't play with you because you caused Pearl Harbor. And I was remember, I, I just thought, I didn't know what Pearl Harbor was. I just thought, okay. But I could tell immediately it was something bad and that I was responsible for it somehow. And it set me apart and I was a bad person. I was different. And I think from that moment on, that and other experiences of racism sort of made me decide that I wanted to be really nice and really accepted and like the same as everybody else. And if people called me racist names, I would just smile and laugh. And that's pretty much how I dealt with racism for a lot of my um, young adult life and going into being an adult um, until I turned that around for myself. But it was hard because I just learned that it was more important to be liked and accepted than being told that I caused Pearl Harbor or whatever else it is. Um, so that kind of shaped a lot of my early writing and, 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 and shapes my writing now. Um, my own early experiences, but also just what's going on in our community and in the world. Um, yeah, I actually had this similar experience, like just when I was little, because kids just, you know, they say stuff they don't know. Although I have to say, I honestly didn't think anyone would actually say the Pearl Harbor thing. That's just wild. <laughs> like, I think I even made up a, in, in, in my short story in um, Come On In, this, I had a child say to, or I had a teenager say to the main character something about, oh, my grandfather died at Pearl Harbor and sort of indirectly blaming it on her and her grandparents. And I thought, I, I honestly thought like, maybe that's pushing it too far, but um, I see that it's not. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, but the same thing I had um, really early on, like early experiences, that shaped my worldview, I guess, right? Um, and and going, I mean, and going back, this is when I don't remember, um, but because I, I was just one. But my mom was on the bus. She was eight months pregnant with my little sister, and I was one year old. And like, she had to go to the dentist, and she was just dragging me along, and I was crying. And um, the bus was full, and nobody stood up to let her sit down, which I think is just like, that's like. You know, I can't think of any other reason that they would have that that situation would have happened if she except that she was Asian. Um, and yeah, and kids made fun of me when I was six, seven years old, you know, like doing the like pulling their eyes and going like ching chong and I saw I saw and I, I didn't I, I didn't even know what that meant. I just knew that, you know, I understood why they were doing it. And it made me hate being Asian. It made me um, wish I were white, you know, like every time you draw, you know, like draw a picture of a princess. They were always blonde, always had blue eyes. Whenever I, you know, like I would write stories sometimes and, you know, you imagine yourself in the story, but it was always a white person at the center of the story. It was never an Asian person. So um, yeah, and uh, when I thought about writing my first book, um, It's Not Like It's a Secret, uh, I knew I wanted an Asian protagonist. This was back in 2014 when I was thinking about it. And, um, uh, and, and well, actually I'm skipping, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, and I wanted to have her come into herself and understand what that, that being Asian is cool, right? That was an experience that I had as well. Like when I was in high school, a girl, another Asian girl, 
aggressively friendly as I like to call her like wanted to be friends with me and was already friends with an Asian a group of Asian kids and um, when I started hanging out with them is when I realized like oh like it's kind of cool to be Asian like there's this whole whole group of people who understand things the way that my other friends don't understand things and um, so I wrote a story in which the protagonist has that experience and um, it was so much fun for me. I think I have similar experiences. I feel like in the terms of this question, it's sort of like, how doesn't it impact us or how hasn't it? Because even if it's not in those overt ways, which happen too frequently, it's there. It's part of the systems. It's part of the structures that have impacted our lives. So in terms of overt things, you know, for sure, kids pulling their eyes up, the ching chong, wing wong. But I mean, I wish I could say stuff like that stopped when I was young, but I can think, I think it's in so many experiences. It's like watching my mom at the farmer's market standing in line and then having the person help everyone around her, except for her, you know, and it's in the student who asked me like, Miss Ho, why do you teach English? And she's like a student I was close with. And it's sort of like, why are you asking me that? Is it because I'm Asian? Yeah, you know, like most Asian people don't speak English very well or things like that. Um, But I think that for me to what Misa was saying I've had so many experiences I feel like they continue to happen because you know the invisibility as an Asian American person growing up was such that it was so prevalent I never questioned it and it hasn't been until I've been much older that I've been able to have like you know experiences in college with all Asian like an Asian dance troupe or my first Asian teacher in grad school Um, experiences like that where you're sort of like whoa that's what it's like oh to like feel like I'm not code switching into something to know that I just walk into this group of people who just understands or I don't need to explain or I don't need to I you know and and I feel like I had this experience just on Friday we did a town hall at my school about AAPI Heritage Month and my school my school is predominantly Latinx and Black and um, Polynesian and but we do have um, a few Asian staff members sorry train (laughs) I remember, I just remember like while I was watching these like presentations from different teachers and people speaking about their experiences, I was like, I code switched my whole life. And I didn't realize, you know, I talk about code switching, I've like done PDs on it. And I didn't realize until last week that I've been doing it my whole life too. I I think because we are so often cast as white adjacent, you know, um, I agree, like that whole thing about code switching. I I, I always thought, like, I don't do that, right? I don't, um, I understand, I, I, because we, so many of us grow up, not everybody, obviously, but many Asians grow up surrounded by white people. And so it becomes second nature, but I, yeah, I never thought about that, that it's different when I'm with just Asians um, and I'm not, the radar aren't always like going beep, 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 beep. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. i mean i've had people also yeah, nancy oh no go ahead no i was just really quickly gonna say i've had um a principal that i worked for tell me he didn't consider me asian he thought of me as white and i remember being like what the f-? you know mm-hmm. so white adjacency both within our community and outside the community is very real yeah wow um I started my writing career doing a lot of ghostwriting for kids series and, and, and um, you know, without credit. Um, and it was a great way to get break into the business. But my experience those years of trying to write about racism or at least trying to have representation in my writing mm-hmm. was literally my editors just saying, um, you know, yes, it would be great to have one minority character and make sure it's not a stereotype. And that was literally it. And if I had, several different characters from different marginalized communities. It was like, well, I think that's enough now, you know, this, that kind of feeling about it. And so I just kind of taught myself to not write about Asian American characters or Asian characters, or even characters who were just not white, because it was expected that the main characters were white. It's about the white experience. And then maybe they had a couple of friends who were Japanese American, who were African American. Mm -hmm. So I just sort of taught myself that Asian American stories, Asian American characters just really didn't matter. We were we were minor characters, we were side characters. 
Right. Um, and it took me a long time before I sort of got the confidence, probably now, like recently, where I thought, well, no, I'm going to write a story about what it's like to be Asian American in the Northeast. We actually matter. But it took a really long time. Yeah, and Nancy, you bring up a, a really good point. And in terms of the creative perspective, like what is going through your mind as you create these characters in your book, which have to face um, anti-Asian racism? Um, how do you eventually settle, settle down these characters and then the antagonist part of it and bystanders? And, and sometimes the antagonist is actually not a bad person, right? But sometimes they do it without even realizing it versus uh, other antagonists who are actually intentional in um, causing harm. Um, so just to tell us a little bit about your process and how you come up with these characters um, and your mindset. Yeah, um, so again, all these years when I sort of didn't write about Asian American characters, Asian American experience, I'm now starting to think about it, but it's, it's, it's really baby steps for me. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I did grow up thinking I have to act as white as possible because you know if I'm Asian, I get ostracized. So I'm just gonna be super white. Um, and it's only recently that I started really realizing my worth as a person and the, the worth of my characters as Asian Americans, for example. Um, I, have, I have not yet written a book that was directly about the Asian American experience or about some really overt act of racism, which would be similar to say, um, Angie Thomas's book, The Hate You Give. I mean, there, I, don't, I don't have anything like that, although I'd like to explore it in the future. Um, so far, it's been it's been kind of sideways. I get it in sideways about a book that's about something else. Um, Bewitch and Witch Rising are about witches who are living in a society where witchcraft is illegal, but it's supposed to be a metaphor for racism and homophobia and transphobia and so forth. Um, and it was always a challenge for me because I didn't want to bludgeon my readers over the head with like racism is bad, you know. But I wanted to explore these ideas and explore my witches' own sort of self hatred or or, or, or sense of acceptance or non-acceptance. Um, I'm now working on a middle grade, which is more about the Asian experience. It's kind of a coming of age based on my own upbringing in Tokyo and in Ohio. Um, and it, it's fun for me, but again, I, I can see based on sort of growing up and how I tried to sort of downplay the effects of racism on me, like, oh, it's no big deal, it's just a joke, they're just joking. Um, that I'm a little afraid to go there. I'm a little afraid to be strong and heavy handed with a with a anger against racists. And I, that's something I really wanna explore myself and kind of push a little bit. I mean, I think um, like, and you know, you all free, feel free to jump in, but I think one reason, like, I think one of your, you, you had a question, Mary, on, on, their, on your list about like why, um, why Asian American or right, anti-Asian racism has been addressed typically sort of like that, like in a sort of subtle or, <clears throat> indirect or um way and I I wonder I mean I think it has to do with that white adjacency thing right uh, at least the, the people who are have been most published have been East Asian right and so if we're thinking about sort of the the breadth of the Asian American experience the East Asian American experience is the one that everyone most most people are familiar with just because uh the you know Chinese Americans were the first sort of the big group and Japanese Americans historically to be here and, um, and, and be visible. And um, yeah, and, 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 and we were seen as brown, right? We were seen as outsiders in the beginning, right? There was the Chinese Exclusion Act where we weren't, like we, I'm not Chinese, um, Chinese Americans were not allowed to immigrate. And then that, that came to include Japanese Americans and obviously there was the internment and um, people, uh, you know, racist white people actually referred to Asian, East Asians as brown people, right? And there was all kinds of violence and perpet perpetrated against us. But um, now that we have a bigger voice and have been publishing, especially in the last 20 to 30 years, I feel like because we feel like we're white adjacent, we don't have the right to, to speak out um, because we don't suffer the same level of violence um, and sort of overt systemic racism as, let's say, Black people. And, um, and it's true, but I think also, yeah, so there's not as sort of as much to confront in some ways 
it seems it, I, I think people feel that way. Um, I don't know. What do you what do you think about it? Um, just to jump in, I actually think that. So I think part of it in terms of the hesitation for Asians in general, whether it's in Kidlet or outside, is because we don't know and we don't learn and we've never learned our history here. Mm -hmm. Like we don't even know. I think just not we as a whole group, some people know, but we were never taught. And so for us to learn, we have to really put in the work on our own to understand the history, which goes way before, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which includes mm -hmm. slaves brought from the Philippines, you know, in like the 1500s and then slaves brought to like at the post slavery to sort of take over that work, the slave position. You know, so there's so much history we don't know in terms of the violence and how it's been baked into our system. So I think that there's what you're saying, there's a white adjacency, I think for some Asian folks. And then I think in general, a lot of people don't feel like they understand it enough themselves to speak on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think for me, uh, uh, I'm coming because like my whole like life work sounds kind of corny, but you know, I became an educator because um, of systemic racism, I wanting to disrupt it. That's very much why I became a writer. And so I think I sort of have the opposite problem in which maybe that's all my books are about a little bit and addressed in different ways. Like there's eyes that kiss in the corners, which is more like a joyful celebration, but I'm trying. I think I tried in the first few drafts to weave in like the microaggressions or like more putting down about the eyes and it didn't fit in that story. So it's gonna go into this, into the companion. And then the novel is um, that's coming out next year is very much sort of like head on. It's very much about the very based on the community where I live, which I have to say is one tiny fraction of an Asian experience. But there was a huge suicide epidemic in this community um, of teenagers. And a lot of the narrative, they weren't all Asian kids, but a lot of the narrative was it's Asian culture. You all pressure your kids too much. And so I started, I had that said to me at a dinner table of all white people, not to me, it was like at the dinner conversation and I was at the table and someone was like, well, it's the Asians moving into our community. That's why the pressure is high. That's why the suicide rate is high. And I was looking around like, did anyone see my face? <laughs> like, what are you saying? And, and so I think that got me to thinking, what would it be like as an Asian parent to have that blamed, like your child's suicide blamed on you? And that's sort of where this book came from. But um, it was very much inspired by Angie Thomas's, I'm not saying it's anywhere near that quality, but um, wanting to have a story that addresses racism head on because I don't think we see it enough. Yeah. So I think my challenge is not wanting to center an Asian narrative that's always about pain because I think that's what happens for marginalized folks is the narratives that are told are always pain narratives. And then I feel like where the tension is that I like wrestle with is our narrative is one of invisibility. Like nobody even knows the pain. So I feel like we need to be direct and, and discuss it and address it head on and it needs to be within a context of multitudes of stories so that that's not the only narrative that we end up telling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And also there's the kind of the other issue which is kind of the crazy rich Asians issue which is having like this fun rom-com with Asians in it but it doesn't, it's not about racism, it's not about pain. It's just this fun rom-com about, you know with Asian characters in it. Um, and is there a space for books like that right, amongst us, so that we're not even dealing with racism and that we're just getting some representation out there in these kind of lighter genres. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it would be great if we had everything, right? Like it's that whole, the, 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 the danger of a single story. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, there was, I, I was, I heard a comic saying something about, it was an Asian comic and he went to, he was at the airport and he bought a tuna, or he had with him a tuna fish sandwich. And he was afraid that if he ate it and it stank, everyone, he was like, I'd just be creating a new stereotype for us. <laughs> People would be like, oh, <laughs> Asians eat tuna fish sandwiches at airports. And um, because there's so few of us and our work out there, and especially I wanna, you know, um, emphasize that you know, it has been mostly East Asian 
um, stories, which is, you know, great, but uh, there's a whole, you know, there are 100, I did, you know, 148 Asian countries, you know, and, and thousands of ethnic groups. And there's a huge swath of Asian Americans that have been completely kind of silenced and erased um, because, oh, we have Japanese, Chinese, Korean stories. So like we've got Asian America covered and um, there, you know, there's uh, just a, a Hmong population, you know, um, Philippine, no population, Philippine X, <laughs> uh, you know, Thai, Vietnamese, so many, so many um, stories that I think are being ignored or or pushed aside because we've got our Asian stories already. And then I would just throw into Pacific Islander stories too. Mm -hmm. I learned like there's the Polynesia and Micronesia and Melanesia and the history of why that all got split up. But you know, I think when you look at the statistics, it's like not even 1% of stories yeah. in Kidlam have yeah. Polynesian characters. Yeah, um, I really noticed sorry. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah. It's, so, it's so many different groups um, and the type of racism and discrimination experienced by someone who is Southeast Asian, it could be drastically different from someone who is East Asian. And so how does that affect you, the way that you even approach the, you know, the topic of this in your books and, you know, what challenges have you faced in trying to incorporate um, these types of differences? Well, one, one thing I was going to say when you were speaking, Misa, I kept thinking about publishing. So, right, a lot of these things have to start with the publishing world. It has to start with editors and agents um, actually really being interested in these diverse Asian stories and not just like, oh, we have our Asian book for the fall, so we don't need any more. I mean, just really being interested in the diversity of Asian voices. Um, and also people like us to some degree, published authors mentoring young voices. People, I mean, pu you know, publishing is really hard. It's really hard to get your book published. And so published authors have a lot to offer young writers from diverse Asian backgrounds, um, mentoring them in terms of, of how to go about getting an agent, for example, you know, really mentoring them and holding their hand and trying to get them out there. So I think just that kind of ground up work by the Asian community to try to get more Asian voices uh, mm -hmm. out there is really important. Um, yeah, I... Um... I, in terms of addressing it in my books, I really, I mean, I haven't, partly because, you know, we've talked about this, there's a, a hesitancy to use a voice that's not your own or feature a voice that's not your own. But I, I also feel like, mm, you know, that's, there are sensitivity readers and, and authenticity readers that, that we, could, we could make use of. Um, yeah, I live in the Bay Area um, where there are, Kind of a multiplicity of Asians, uh, back people from Asian different Asian backgrounds, and um, so yeah. In my latest in the, uh, Love and Other Natural Disasters, there's a Filipino husband, um, and you know, I, and I it was one of those things I considered talking about um, anti-Filipino racism within the Asian community. Uh, and, 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 you know, and that's something else we can, we can talk about too, but I, yeah, I ended up shying away from it. I sort of wanted to keep the focus somewhere else, but, um, there's definitely room for expansion, at least in my work. I think it comes back to this idea of the single story Misa brought up earlier is, um, I agree. Like I, the more I'm learning, I feel like a very new writer still, but the more I learn about writing, the more I realize, like, I don't, I don't feel comfortable, nor do I feel like I should be writing outside of them. That's a very personal choice, right? Like my personal experience, um, like what's really coming from my heart. But I also feel like there's a responsibility, you know, to tell multitudes of stories. So I love what Nancy said about being part of a community that is continually lifting up others in this industry that is so hard. I mean, I think about how hard for Isaac Kiss in the Corners, for example, is on sub for over a year and a half. And that's as an East Asian person who has more stories already being told that has, is more part of a familiar narrative. And so it's hard 
for all of us. So we have to all lift each other to make sure all of our stories are told. And as an East Asian person, I also can tell stories though. And that's something that I haven't done yet, but would love to explore about like inter-Asian relations. And cause there's so much complex history in our communities. You know, I think about like World War II or even before that, like my grandma, grew up speaking Japanese and she was born in Taiwan because Taiwan was occupied by China, which means like there's Chinese resentment towards Japanese and people and there's things that, you know, complexities and nuances within this narrative. Ali Wong, you know, she has like this bit where she talks about like fancy Asians and jungle Asians and that's very <laughs> real and the Asian, I mean, it's, you know, Ali Wong, she says whatever she wants, she's Ali, but like that's a very real dynamic that exists within the Asian community so and then talk about like colorism all of that and so I think that there is space for us to continue to explore uh, you know to push the boundaries of that single story um, a lot more mm -hmm. yeah and also everyone's writing in different genres as well and it's important for you know authors of different genres you know even romance sci-fi fantasy etc to just incorporate these kind of you know, themes in their books, but, you know, in, in, in the subplot and subtext, but um, really, you know, have it as um, a storytelling and incorporating into this narrative. And I mean, there's so many challenges to um, do that as well. But in terms of even, you know, as, as you had mentioned earlier, a subtle approach to writing and what about incorporating this sort of um, violence and given this recent violent events that have happened in the Asian com community. And there's a need for a change um, and more stories that has to um, do with that and just promote diversity and promote love and you know, promote all of these um, you know, um, things at a younger age um, rather than um, older. Yeah, I wanna, I, I mean, I've been thinking about a lot about the stories of the women and their families um, in Atlanta um, and I mean, that is definitely a story that hasn't been told like, and it's a, and it's a real one and it's a significant one. Um, you know, like there's the stereotype of the Asian, um, women, the, the like nail salons in my area. Right. And, um, and, and haircutting places like where you just go to get a cheap haircut and, um, they're a significant part of our population. They have families, they have teenagers, they have children whose stories aren't being told. And, and, and they're not, you know, they're not the like Silicon Valley executive suite, although yeah, fewer Asians in the E suites right now, <laughs> or the C suites, the Silicon, you know, they're, they're not <laughs> the like stereotypical, like, oh, we're getting all A's and going to Ivy League schools, um, kids. And um, yeah, I, where am I going with this? That, that's a whole chunk of stories that I <laughs> need to have told, I guess. and and who have, who have, um, who are sort of closer to that, um, who are, or I should say who, yeah, who are closer to that sort of direct brutal racism. And again, I don't want to just focus stories on pain and trauma, um, but it's a reality also that I think the nation generally has not been aware of. I, I was thinking um, a while back about and so when I was growing up and even when I was an adult, I had this experience of something I used to call benign racism, right? People would come up to me and say, where are you from? Mm -hmm. I would say, because I know where they were going with this. So I'd say Ohio, or I'd say New York, and they press it. Where are you from? They're like, where are you from? And they wanted me to say, I'm, what, you know, I'm from Japan, I'm from wherever. And you know, later I, I came to see that, that it, it, was, it, was, it was a not so subtle way of saying, I'm, I don't belong, I'm not American. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an outsider, where am I from? And, um, but I thought I wasn't supposed to be bothered by that, right? Because I, I even label it as benign racism. But then, uh, I don't know. Just and my mom like, would say, my, sorry to interrupt. I just want to say, my mom would say like, they're just being curious, just let it go. Right, right. That, that whole let it go thing, right? And then like a few years ago, I saw some, I, I met someone who told me the same story. And I almost wept because I was like, oh, other people go through this too and it's okay to be bothered by it it's almost like we need to give ourselves permission to be upset or angry or sad that we're treated this way rather than label it like benign or like oh it's just it's not a big deal um but i think part of what i want to do anyways with my writing past present and future is to give kids permission to be angry or bothered mm -hmm. by this stuff and not just take it 
and not just laugh it off and not just, you know, try to fit in. Um, I just, I want, I want to give kids like who I used to be permission to just be like, yeah, this isn't right. This isn't cool when people say this or do this to me. Um, so however that nets out, that's kind of my goal um, with my writing. I love that. I feel very similar in that way in terms of like wanting to give young people tools for having these critical conversations, for analyzing all of these messages that you don't even know you're receiving just by swimming in the water that is systemic racism, uh, which is our country. So like having the tools to analyze and dissect and be critical instead of just internalizing everything. I think something that I wrestle, not I wrestle with, but I think about a lot is like this balance between the subtlety in stories of addressing racism versus the head on approach. And if we, I think where the trap is, is if we don't have those conversations outside of the reading, then the subtlety is totally missed. Right. Like if you don't know what to look for, you don't you haven't had that context or you don't have the framework or the scaffold in educator speak. When you see it in story, you won't even know you're seeing it if it's woven in subtly versus like you have the lens and then you see it like, whoa, dang, this was so brilliant the way that the author wove this in. And so it's important, whether it's in our stories or not, to like to push the conversation so that we have the framework, however we choose to use it. Yeah, I, that totally, so one thing I want to say is, so Joanna's book, Eyes That Kiss in the Corners, is one of those books, by the way, where you did, you you, you address this, um, the, the sort of Western beauty standards as foisted upon us, right, by the, the pool blue, or I forget, the, the, the blue eyes of this girl's friend. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Joanna's book is a book that celebrates um, that sort of monolid Asian eye shape and makes it into a thing of beauty and that connects us with our, our families and our history. And, um, and you don't say people are terrible and make fun of us for our eyes, but it's, but um, I think everybody Asian in this country will like know that that's there. And um, yeah, and it's a celebration and it's pushing back against the standard without accusing anybody or you know and and um but i but i think it would be easy for someone who hasn't experienced that or who doesn't understand the history of the racism behind this like pulling the eyes to be like just think of it like oh that's so sweet what a nice story and and not see the you know like there's this that history underneath um yeah and it, it um which, yeah, in, in, in my books, I try to have the characters have those conversations, right? Unpack some of the racism that they experience out loud. And I, um, yeah, that was my hope as a former teacher that like maybe this could be in a classroom and the teacher would like say, hey, let's talk about this conversation that they have in this book where they're saying racist things and, it's, and, and the other person calls it out and then the person who said it doesn't understand what's racist about it and like, what do we think? And um, I... Yeah, so I guess that's also my way of answering the question of this is how I bring it in. I have the con the have the characters have those conversations or or have fights where they don't understand why each other is upset. I just here's the Joanna Misa Love Fest, but I feel like I mean, look, this time will be different. That's probably one of the first times I've ever seen a conversation about racism with you know addressed from an Asian perspective in a book. And I remember reading like, dang, okay, Misa, okay, like it was so awesome. And like, okay, like we, we can do this in books, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think something that's scary though about doing it is knowing that as we're all on this journey and we're not gonna get it right as, and every book will be different. And so no matter how you write it, you're gonna piss someone off. I think that's actually really scary. Even like Eyes That Kiss in the Corners, like, um, some people were mad for just some people are upset because I referenced a white person at all. Um, and, you know, I have to say some of that anger was like people who didn't read the book and just saw it before it was ever published. But like, you know, there's a danger because what I was trying to do, maybe people didn't interpret that as like I wanted to address the systemic racism of why that's the standard, but other people view it as being like, why do you even have to bring white people into this at all? Why do you, why can't you just celebrate Asian beauty? Oh, and then the flip side is, 
how come this doesn't work for me if I have an adopted child and this, you know, so I feel like there's a lot of, it feels like landmines, but I guess where I'm landing now is like, we just have to do the thing and then learn each time and do it better. But it's scary <laughs> to, to like piss people off and have it. Be no, scary. absolutely. I think it's, I think that's why um, a lot of times we've been kind of prone to let's keep quiet. Let's not file these reports. Right. Even though we struggle with acts that are committed to agents, but we, you know, we just like with the survival skill, right. We're just trying to survive a lot of times. And but now I think it's time to push forward, get more of these books into libraries and schools and start the education process in terms of just looking, incorporating Asian American history as well. And, um, you know, and, you know, even growing up as a kid, um, you know, I never saw any of these books. So thank you to all of you that has to write these books for my children and my children get to experience all of these books um, and, you know, learn about their um, Asian culture and some of the things that happen so that they can actually have the voice and hopefully empower our, our kids to have that voice to, um, to speak up, uh, you know, against um, all of this. But um, do you, any of you have any recommendations for books? Uh, summer reading is coming up. I know my kids will be interested <laughs> in um, hearing about some of your book recs. Um, I have one. Uh, and it, it's a book that just came out recently. And, um, and it is a yeah, direct confrontation of racism in, in um, it's, it's uh, nonfiction and it's called From a Whisper to a Rallying Cry. Um, and it's about the Vincent Chin um, murder, which happened in the 80s, the 80s? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it, by Paula Yu. And um, yeah, again, for, 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 for viewers who don't know, Vincent Chin was, um, it was during the 80s when the, like Japan was kind of on the rise and like it was in, in Detroit, uh, car factory, you know, American car factories, people who worked in them were suffering <clears throat> for, for all kinds of reasons. And, um, uh, and, and Japan's rise was just one of them. And um, this guy, Vincent Chin got, was at a bar and ended up um, being just brutalized and um, and murdered and by by two white men and uh, and it was yeah it's, and, and, and it's a story that really people don't know uh, but it's I mean it's the whole I mean there's so many layers right so this this idea that it's okay to to take your anger out on on someone who's been scapegoated and this mistaken identity also or this lumping of all Asians into one ent entity um anyway uh that's a book so it's called from a whisper to a rallying cry I'll do two I think book recommendations are always hard I just saw on Twitter someone I think it was Cynthia Lydic Smith she said something about like it's not about the stars it's about the constellation so I feel that tension between like, oh, I don't only want to name one or two. I want to tell them about all the amazing books everywhere. But um, since we don't have all that time, two that I recommend, one is um, Lakshmi's Mooch, which is by Shelley Anand. It's a picture book about a little Indian girl who has a little mustache, a mooch. Yeah. And um, it's sort of like her journey. It's really cute and it's funny, but it's also about, it's also like a self uh, acceptance body positivity book from a South Asian perspective. And then the other one is The Best We Could Do. Um, it's a graphic novel written by T. Boy, who um, is also an educator in the Bay Area and it is brilliant. It is about um, a kind of a refugee immigrant experience and it's so powerful. So I, I read it in like two hours, <laughs> super good. These sound amazing. Thank you guys. I'm definitely gonna have to um, check out those uh, books. Um, since we're um, close to time, do you have any upcoming projects, comments that you would like to share with us? And how can we stay uh, connected with all of you? Joanna's got a few projects coming up. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so I shared the cover of Playing at the Border. That one is a picture book coming out this September. It is um, Yo-Yo Ma when he played at the border of Mexico and Texas to send a message about building bridges and not walls. 
the companion to eyes that kiss in the corners is out next january that is from about a young boy and the microaggressions he faces at school and his male family members and then the novel that's coming out in the summer and a few more projects uh, over the next few years um, and in terms of where to find me i'm on twitter and uh, not that often but on instagram much more often and my it's at uh, joanna ho writes um, so I have a uh, Witch Rising coming out um, in September, and I'm, as I said, I'm working on a middle grade novel, which is um, a, a real coming of age novel. Um, it's, it's probably the most autobiographical thing I've ever written, and um, just sort of like referring back to what we were talking about before, I've been working on it a really long time, and people have read it over the years. I, editors, agents have all kind of been like, yeah, yeah, it's interesting, but not been super enthusiastic. But now there's more enthusiasm for it, I think, because of what's going on, um, which I'm really glad for. I'm, I'm really glad that maybe this is a good time to tell stories like this. Um, and so, yes, I'm on Instagram and Twitter as well. And my, my website is nancyoline.com. And when I'm being efficient, I tend to up, you know, update it with information. So that's where you can find me. Misa has a book publishing in a few days. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm back. Um, uh, yes, this is the book that's coming out in June, June 8th, Love and Other Natural Disasters. Uh, and it's a, it's a rom-com. It's a very tropey, um, fake dating, um, San Francisco bike rides, rowboat rides, all kinds of good stuff like that. Um, and I am, I, I can't say right now um, out loud. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, what 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 is coming next? But uh, if you yeah follow me on Twitter or Instagram at miscellaneous one. I just changed my <laughs> name and because it's hard to spell. <laughs> um, so at miscellaneous one. I'm on Instagram and Twitter, and uh, there should be an announcement about my next um, book books uh within the next couple of weeks i'm really <laughs> excited it's gonna be a lot of fun <laughs> um and as for me i am working on book two of uh healthcare heroes there's just so many different healthcare professions out there whether it's um certificate or master's bachelor's doctorates um and you know we just want to be as inclusive as possible in the healthcare space so um, working on that. My website is healthcareheroesbook.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram and Twitter as well. You can find me at BR uh, Mary Choi. Um, it was such a lovely time with all of you ladies. Um, I hope um, all of you enjoyed our panel and thank you Asian Author Alliance for hosting this very important discussion on writing about racism and kid lit and providing this platform for us to share personal stories, speak up, and unite against uh, anti-Asian sentiment. Um, check out all of these wonderful books from Joanna Ho, Nancy Olin, and Misa Segura. Um, thank you, everybody. It was great uh, talking with you. Bye. Thank you so thank much. You. Great moderating, Mary. <laughs> thank you, Joanna.